buenos días. Me presento. Mi nombre es Juan Antonio Valor y soy el decano de la Facultad de Filosofía. Muchísimas gracias por, por asistir a este, a este acto que, en el que vamos a, a conversar y a pensar sobre la obra del profesor Petit. Eh, tengo que agradecer al profesor Mauricio Suárez su trabajo y, y también quiero agradecerle eh, pues, eh, el acompañamiento que tenemos en, en el decanato, la ayuda que tenemos en el decanato, así que eh, muchísimas gracias Mauricio. Eh, y esto, pues, eh, este acto quiero señalar que entra en consonancia con lo que con lo que el equipo de canal pues, queremos hacer. ¿no? Entendemos eh, eh, que esta facultad pues, tiene un sello propio y es una facultad en la que, como hay aquí algunos, algunos decanos, pues quiero decirlo, es una facultad en la que nos gusta pues, eh, en fin, estudiar a Kant en alemán y a Aristóteles en griego y estas cosas ¿no? que, que cada vez se hacen menos. Nosotros presumimos de seguir haciéndolas todo lo intensamente que podemos y sabemos, eh, pero también entendemos que todo ello nos tiene que poner en condiciones pues, para saber pensar el presente, para pensar temas de actualidad, para eh, hablar con, eh, con profesores y con eh, investigadores relevantes en el momento actual. Desde este punto de vista, pues, este acto tiene, tiene todo, todo el sentido. Así que no voy a decir mucho más, eh, agradezco el trabajo eh, que ha desarrollado el profesor Molino Suárez para que el profesor Petit pueda estar esta mañana con nosotros. Eh, estas eh, convocatorias no son fáciles, como eh, podéis entender, hay que hacerlas con mucho tiempo y con mucha dedicación, así que, así que en fin, muy agradecido. Eh, thank you very much, profesor. It is eh, for us very important that you are here. Eh, Mauricio, tienes la palabra. Muchas gracias a Juan Antonio. Eh, bueno, como sabéis, este evento tiene lugar en inglés y el debate, tanto como la ponencia, va a ser en ese idioma. Pero el profesor Petit nos ha proporcionado un breve resumen de la conferencia que hemos traducido en el equipo que nos hemos estado reuniendo para preparar esto al español y hemos producido unas cuantas copias del mismo, que están, si no me equivoco, al fondo de la sala, con lo cual agradecería mucho si alguno de vosotros, que estáis ahí al fondo, eh, si no le importa, pasar esas copias de ese... De, 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 que creo que no todo el mundo lo tiene en mano, ¿verdad? Algunos sí lo veo que lo tienen, pero otros no. Entonces, bueno, si lo vais pasando, los que no tengáis la copia, por favor, haceros con uno, porque es un resumen bastante compacto de lo que va a decir aquí el profesor Petit. Como digo, está traducido en el anverso al castellano. Así que, eh, habiendo dicho eso, me paso ya al inglés. En este momento, pues, el, el acto tendrá lugar en, eh, en este video. ¿Qué pasa? All right. It's a great honor <coughs> and a pleasure to have uh, Philip Petit with us. Um, he is, of course, one of the world's leading ethicists, political philosophers, and philosophers of mind and metaphysics. He has many different interests and has made major contributions to philosophy in different areas. Um, and I should maybe warn you, first of all, that although he is known for his political involvement, uh, today's event is an academic event. Um, we're here as philosophers to discuss his work on, on republicanism. So I thought I'd say a few words to explain how this came about. I got engaged in an email correspondence with Philippe about two years ago. Um, and uh, we were uh, robustly debating some, some current issues at the time. This is two years ago. Um, and in the course of this email correspondence, I just happened to ask him um, 
Uh, I thought he would say that, of course, no, I'm too busy and I have too many things to do. I, I, I happen to ask him, would you kindly come to Complutense and give us a talk about um, your latest uh, views on political uh, theory? And the answer came back, yes, of course. Um, but my agenda is busy. So um, can we look at the, uh, the uh, date when uh, um, um, you may be available and in Europe, so we can bring you somewhere close enough. And, and, and we fixed then, two years ago, that today he would be speaking with us here today. Um, and I want to say that not, not just to impress on you how busy your agenda um, Professor Petit runs, uh, but also um, to um, impress on you that the event is completely unrelated to current political events in Spain. I mean, we had no way of, of uh, predicting that we would be in the immediate aftermath of a very meaningful uh, ruling by the Supreme Court and just 10 days away from a national election. Um, so it's in no way been um, um, in, in any ways uh, thought to be scheduled with any of these events. And this is again to emphasize that the nature of the event is purely academic and we're just here to discuss um, his philosophical views as, as philosophers. So I thought I'd say a few words to introduce him, although I think his curriculum is, is well known in Spain. He's one of these few philosophers who has made it into, into the knowledge uh, of the public in general. There aren't that many philosophers who are in, 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 in the public knowing, as it were. Um, but let me just, um, for the sake of um, um, having everybody um, uh, know the basic biographical details, sum up some of his um, outstanding um, uh, achievements. Um, Philip was born in, in Ireland, and he is um, therefore uh, a proud Irish and European citizen, although he now lives in, in the USA. Um, he's a professor at uh, Princeton University, but also part-time at the Australian National University in Canberra. I'll, I'll quickly come to that. Uh, he's, he was educated in, in Ireland. He gained a, a BA in philosophy from the National University of Ireland. Uh, uh, he, he had, he was telling me yesterday, a brief thing um, would he consider the possibility of um, um, following the seminary and, I guess, becoming a priest? Um, but that was quickly abandoned um, for a PhD in philosophy at Queen's uh, University in Belfast. After that, he enjoyed a number of positions. He was a lecturer at the University College in Dublin. Um, a research fellow at Trinity Hall in Cambridge, Cambridge University, and a very young professor at the University of Bradford in Yorkshire, in the north of England. Um, eventually, he was uh, made a professorial fellow at uh, the Australian National University, um, where he landed in the early 80s, I think. That's right. And he spent um, a good 20 years uh, in Canberra, eventually becoming also an Australian citizen. So he's Irish and Australian, but not American. Um, in uh, 2002, he moved to, um, to the University of Princeton as the Rockefeller University professor. And since 2012, he enjoys a joint appointment at Princeton and ANU, where he spends part of the year at um, each place. Um, so I imagine the summer part of the year in each hemisphere at each place, but he can tell us more about that. Later. Um, he has many different honors. He has been made a fellow of all the academies that you can think of, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Royal Irish Academy, the Australian Academies in Arts and Sciences, the British Academy, his corresponding fellow, and has also been awarded a number of honorary degrees, National University of Ireland, the University of Crete and Athens, so he must be very popular in Greece. Um, 
at uh, uh, Lund University, the University of Montreal, and, and Queen's University at Belfast. And he has a very large and very impressive oeuvre uh, throughout these three different disciplines, ethics, political philosophy, philosophy mm -hmm. of mind, which include some very well-known and influential books in all of those three fields. Um, I would mm -hmm. maybe uh, mention his well-known work on republicanism, um, and most uh, recently in that area on the people's terms, a republican theory and model of democracy that came out in, in 2012. Um, and uh, uh, another most, even more recent book, Just Freedom, a book that we've been discussing uh, the last few weeks here on Prudence, um, uh, A Moral Compass for a Complex World that came out in uh, 2015. <coughs> um, then, since then, he's published two books on ethics, The Robust Demands of the Good, Ethics with Attachment, Virtue and Respect, which are um, a summary publication of his Hero Lectures in Ethics, which he gave at Oxford 2015. And even more recently than that, The Birth of Ethics, Reconstructing the Role and Nature of Morality, which came out with Cambridge University Press, and that's the Tanner Lectures at Berkeley. For those of you who don't know, these are some of the most prestigious sets of lectures that one can be invited to speak at. Um, and even more recently this year, he was the Locke Lecturer at Oxford, and uh, I'm told that those lectures will in due course be published as well with Oxford University Press again um, on, on different sets in the, of problems and issues in the philosophy of, of mind. And of course that also um, joined in with a number, a, a very large number of impressive papers in all these uh, different fields uh, he has published throughout, throughout the years. Um, today he's going to give us a talk about his latest thoughts and he's telling me this, there's some <coughs> new ideas in the lecture today that he's developed, so we're going to hear um, he embraced new ground uh, on the topic of democracy. Um, and the title, I think you all have it in the handout, is uh, Democracy of Republican Primers. He's going to be providing a Republican, uh, civic Republican approach to the topic of democracy. It's in the handout. Um, and, and maybe just uh, to round up, I would say another part of the achievement that he's had is that we've had some meetings over the last two weeks at the Complutense and we managed to bring together the traditional Republican and the liberal Republicans on the table and happily discuss his work on just freedom and it was one very enjoyable experience so um, that was, uh, that was uh, also um, an achievement I thought and it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor and, and, and a joy to have him speak to us um, today on the topic of democracy a Republican Prime. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Maurizio. I'm sorry that I'm going to speak in English. I wish I were able to do it in, in Spanish. I do feel it is the great hegemony in today's world that English is so dominant. So I apologize. Then I am Irish. I, I was raised in Gaelic as well as, uh, as, as English. <clears throat> so, What I'm going to say is really summed up <clears throat> in a sentence. And you get the sentence if you read the, the headlines of, my, of, the, um, of the handout, because the sentence goes, in a model democracy, people will control government collaboratively and inclusively, that's section two, via selectional constraints and operational constraints, reducing government's dominating power. I have to say I was driven in a way to write this paper by, I have to describe it as a revulsion against the neo-populist sort of view of democracy. You know, for example, we see all over the world these days, but uh, particularly in England where I just come from, uh, with you know the will of the people is the one thing that matters and it appeared in 2016 and it has told us what we're required to do, and that's it. That's what democracy is about. I mean, purely having that sort of um, majority vote support for a particular policy, and it just railroad through. So 
So basically, I find that conception of democracy incredibly uh, unhistorical, I think totally misleading, and uh, iniquitous, really, in its effects, really malign in the effects that it has on politics. And I don't know how, whether you share this with me, but I, I find it bewildering that someone can become president of the United States, for example, and have such little understanding, such totally minimal understanding of the institutions, you know, that built up that country. Now, I have lots of complaints I would have, we all would have, about the Constitution of the United States or its institutions, but they represent a glorious ideal in aspiration, and I think still give us uh, some very basic elements in a proper understanding of democracy. But that, it seems to me, is totally lost on people like Trump, you know, who basically regard the judiciary as irrelevant, uh, except insofar as they're answering to the elected authorities, like he talks about Obama judges and Trump judges, you know, thereby, and who resist all the freedom of the press, doesn't matter if the press disagrees with you, it's fake news, and equally um, non-governmental uh, organizations, NGOs, you know, are just a nuisance, you know, they're always the elite, they're always, it's just the people in his person, basically, who matter now. I won't rehearse any more, but that explains my own sense that I really wanted to write a, a primer, you know, a primer means a basic introduction to democracy from broadly a civic republican tradition. Okay, so let me go through the elements of that sentence that the titles of the different sections uh, construct. So the first element says, in a model democracy, an ideal democracy, right, people will control government. Now there are two elements in that clause that seem to me to be really important. One is it says people rather than <coughs> the people. <laughs> just as people control government. And the other is it says they will control government. So I'll just say a word about each of those points in that first clause. So why do I say people rather than the people? Well, when you say the point of democracy is for the people to rule or control, the danger in that formulation is that the people refers us to something like a collective agent. And collective agencies of whatever kind often act, for example, through majority voting. And so if you think a democracy requires the people to control government, you very easily move to thinking, well, the people, you know, as formed behind the majority voting, they want such and such. So all democracy is about <coughs> is letting majority vote determine what happens. That seems to me a big mistake right at the very beginning. It's much more important to think about people and the people. Well, why is that? Actually, it's already in Aristotle. Remember what Aristotle says early in the politics? Uh, he says, what makes a happy polity or a happy polis, a happy people? And he basically <coughs> says, you couldn't have a happy city, a happy polis, a happy state, unless you had happy people. He says sometimes, you know, you sometimes you can have elements making up a whole where the property of the whole is different from the property of the parts. So for example, he says you could have two or four odd numbers, you know, five plus seven, twelve plus 5, 17, plus 5, 22, making, an, making an even sum. So this is his example. You could have oddness in the parts, making evenness in the sum of the parts, in the whole, the 22. He, of course, is opposing to Plato at this point, And he wants to say, when it comes to the polis, if you're looking for what is a happy city, you can't get a happy city out of unhappy parts, out of unhappy citizens, the way you can get an even number out of odd numbers. And I think that's a very important observation. It, it supports what I think of as normative humanism or normative individualism, 
which is that if something is good for a group of people, that has to be because it's good for members of the group of people. Uh, the idea that, so to speak, something is good for the group, not so good for the members, but we've got to do it, that would be slightly crazy by most of our views. I take it we're most of us humanists in that sense. The good of a group is always reflected in the good of the individuals. Well, equally now, if we think about control over government as something that's good, uh, you could have control by the people, the group, as expressed in majority voting, that gives no element of control, say, to 45% of the people. They might be shut out. For example, you've got a major divide in the population along religious lines, think of Northern Ireland. So if you think about control as a good thing, a good thing that democracy makes possible, it's got to be a control that individual people consider severally or separately as part of the group, that they have a share of. And it can't be just regarded as something of the whole. Okay? That's the first point. It's people who've got to enjoy control. But the second element in this first clause in my sentence says that people should control government. Now there are two contrast points. There are many, but there are two contrasts in particular I think up to the word control. Someone might say, someone like Schumpeter, for example. Um, you know, Joseph Schumpeter, the famous economist and political theorist who wrote that book in 1942 called Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, famously defends the view of democracy that actually is very close to the view of the populists today support. And unfortunately, many political scientists, I think, have come to support. And what it says is, what democracy is about is just people electing government. That's all there's to it. You just get people who elect government every three or four or five years, and, and then they forget about it. Then the, you know, the government rules in between. Of course, they may have a concern with re-election, and that may give them a thought to the sorts of policies they introduce. But basically, between elections, the people go to sleep, and the government is in total control. Now, interestingly, um, for example, um, in the Federalist Papers, um, Madison, you know, written by um, um, Madison, J. and Hamilton, Madison writes that if you had that sort of system where it was just elections and in between silence or sleep, then you'd have what he called an elective despotism. You just simply have a despot, you know, that you changed every few years, but the despot was, was not controlled in between elections. I want to say the first thing, first reason for emphasizing control in democracy is that it's not just about elections. Elections are important, I'm going to argue they're crucial, but they're only important because they're an element in the control that people have over government. They're not the be-all and end-all. They're not the whole, the whole thing, so to speak. Actually, just 30 or 40 years ago, Lord Hailsham, who was uh, a major uh, judicial and, and, and uh, uh, figure in England, talked about an electoral dictatorship uh, because he thought at that time that England was moving in that direction. So I think you'll all agree with me that it can't be just about elections, because that's consistent with government being really quite despotic, quite tyrannical, having an enormous degree of control, having a lot of discretion, and being able to serve, for example, special interests, maybe their own interests, maybe the interests of those who are funding them, maybe the interests of an elite, maybe the interests of even a, uh, an ethnic or religious majority in oppressing a minority, if elections were all that they were to democracy, then all of that is possible, and that's not very appealing or attractive. So I say it's control, not elections. But there's another antonym, there's another contrast term to the word control, which is that the people should rule in democracy. The people should be 
themselves ruling themselves. Now here there's a very interesting terminological history that I think has been forgotten here. The word democracy is, of course, as we all know, a Greek word, democratia, from demos meaning people, and kratos meaning control. And what it meant to the Greek world was that democracy is a system in which ordinary people have a lot of demos, have a lot of kratos, or power. That's all it means. And for example, as the historian Joshua Ober has really shown, uh, the Greeks did not mean any specific system of government by the word democracy. They just meant any of a number of systems that would give ordinary people a lot of influence or power, kratos. And so, for example, in Athens itself, <coughs> it was mainly a lotocratic system, you know, a system whereby people are appointed on the basis of selection by lot. Uh, it wasn't like a democracy in our sense. Um, but they would have called that a democracy. The word democracy gets to be associated with people ruling themselves only, ironically, in the 1500s, the 16th century, <coughs> in the work of the French legal theorist Jean Baudin, who's, of course, a great absolutist and was followed in that by Thomas Hobbes, the English theorist in the 17th century. And if you remember Baudin and Hobbes, what they argue is the following. They say, first of all, the republican tradition of a mixed constitution that gave a lot of power to ordinary people, actually, but that involved different centers of power, divided, decentralized government. You know, as in Rome, for example, where you had the Senate, but you also had the Tribal Assembly and the Centurion Assembly, and they all did different jobs, like the Senate was mainly executive, the Tribal Assembly mainly voted on laws, and that involved most of the people, not all, but most, and the, of the male people, it should be said, and the Centurion Assembly involved the election, basically, of officers, and the officers elected themselves were divided. You had the consuls, and there were always two of them. <clears throat> and they were only there for a year. And you had the other officers, where you often had six or seven or ten in that particular office, checking and balancing one another. The mixed constitution is what basically people like Bodan and Hobbes would have seen as the system you had in place, for example, in the northern Italian cities of the Renaissance period and earlier medieval period, where ordinary people did have a lot of influence. And the one thing they want to say, being absolutists, they want a really single powerful ruler, they say that doesn't work at all. It's dysfunctional. They both mock the mixed constitution, push it aside and say the only functional state, the only functional sort of polity is one where you've got a single ruler. Now, of course, they say that single ruler could be a king, a monarch, queen. But equally, they say it could be a single group agent, a single committee, right, acting together. That's very different from the mixed constitution, where you've got <coughs> different bodies having to coordinate. And they call the, if it's a committee of just the elite who rule, and that's a possibility, they think it's a committee of the part of the people. And then they introduce the word democracy. And this is the first time that it's used for that sort of system. That's my sense. I've checked with a lot of historians. I'm not primarily a historian. And I'd love it if somebody would put me right on this. But I think it's the first time that the word democracy is used for this. And what it consists in they say, is a committee of the whole, a committee in which all citizens are a part. It's all male citizens, of course. It's sometimes all property sister, uh, citizens, but let's put that aside. It's a system of whereby the people rule themselves by all coming together in a plenary assembly. How do they rule themselves? They both say, by majority voting. Right? 
And they say, that's democracy. So we've got three systems. We throw out the mixed constitution. The only system known to that period, I think, to that period, that really gave ordinary people a lot of influence, like Rome, or indeed Athens, which is also a mixed constitution, I would say. They throw that out, and they say, single ruler has to be a single monarch, or a committee of the few, the aristocracy, or a committee of the whole, which they call democracy. Now, they do that because they think everyone's got to say committee of the whole. Well, that can't possibly work. How could you get everybody together to vote and so on? So they, they basically invent the word democracy for a system they think no one would think acceptable. So you throw it out. And maybe a committee of the few would work. But again, they think that everyone's going to believe much better to have a single ruler. And that's what they want, a monarchy. They want an absolute monarchy, of course, where you've got a sovereign uh, who is totally in charge. And that's what Baudin wants in France, because he writes his book in 1576, which is four years after St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, you know, when 10,000 Huguenots were massacred, killed in France. And he thinks the only way of having peace in the wake of a reformation, the reformation, is to have a single ruler. So he wants a single monarch. Hobbes, writing in the 1640s, the period of the English Civil War, as you remember, equally wants a powerful ruler. And like Baudin, he uses the word democracy for this system of everybody ruling, you know? Uh, but he uses it because he thinks no one would take it seriously. The only one who actually took democracy seriously in that way, though ironically he doesn't call it democracy, is of course Rousseau in the social contract. And I gather we may have a chance to talk about that after lunch, those of us who were meeting after lunch. Um, I just think that um, the Rousseauian, I have a lot to say about the Rousseauian assembly, but I won't, can't say it now, but I think democracy as we know it could not involve certainly a plenary assembly of the kind that Rousseau thought of. Of course, you might say, well, maybe we could do it on computers. You know, every Friday afternoon, every Friday evening, we come home and we're asked to vote on the latest law, and then we do it by majority voting. But I don't know whether any of you know this work, but in independent work with Christian List from the LSC, um, we showed that majority voting just can't work <coughs> in a committee. Because even if there are three people in a group, and each of them votes consistently on a set of issues, the majority may vote inconsistently on those issues. So if I may, Juan Antonio and Maurizio and I are a group that's those of three. You might think of us as the people with three groups, if you like, but think of us three individuals. We're a committee. We want to rule. We've got decisions to make. The decisions connect with one another. Well, suppose, let me do it abstractly because of time uh, constraints. Suppose we have to vote on three issues like whether P is the case, whether Q is the case, and then whether P and Q is the case. Well, we vote on P. Let's suppose Juan Antonio says no to P, but Maurizio and I say yes to P. So the group votes P. Great. We believe P. OK. We make P low, or let P go low. And then we come to the issue of the Q. But now Maurizio is disagreeable and says no to Q. But Juan Antonio and I say yes to Q. So Q gets it. That's terrific. But now we have a separate vote, and this sort of issue comes up all the time, on the conjunction P and Q. Well, who's going to vote for P and Q? Well, not Juan Antonio, because he said no to P. And not Maurizio, because he said no to Q. I'm the only one who's going to vote for P and Q. And as a group, we're going to vote against P and Q. We're going to vote not P and Q. So as a group, we're going to hold, even though each of us is consistent, notice, we're going to defend P, Q, but not P and Q. 
Now that just shows you the difficulty of majority voting. And if you were to extend it to people voting on their computers on a Friday afternoon, you know, you would get a mess of laws that would end up being totally inconsistent with one another. You then have to get some other system, and you might get a system of, of so to speak, uh, straightening these out, introducing consistency, but that would be like a that would be like a, the Supreme Court of the United States. It would be really giving an awful lot of power, too much power, to that group, so to speak. Excuse me, I've got to turn off my uh, ringer. Okay, so I've taken too long. First element then, ordinary people must be involved, not just the people. And ordinary people, they can't be, it's not enough to just elect government, and it's too much to expect they should all be in government. So the only remaining possibility is that they should control government. Now, what does control mean? Well, when I control a, a process, even I as an individual, right, I have to have an influence on the process. I'll be capable of having an influence on the process. And that influence has to push the process in a direction that's really welcome to me. So an example I sometimes give, do you remember the old <coughs> Western menu? Any of the audience are too young, maybe they're not shown any the old Western movies, you know, films, where you get the cowboy strumming the guitar on his horse, you know, as the cattle go ahead of him, and he leads the cattle to the railhead, you know, in the old Western movie. And he never seems to do anything except strum his guitar. Does he control the cattle? <coughs> well, I say he does actually. He's got a, a sort of standby control. Because he's there, and if any head of cattle, any animal, wanders off the track, he's going to be alerted to that, and he's going to ride in and put that head of cattle back on the track. And then he's going to go back and strum his guitar, you know, on his horse, while the cattle follow their heads, as we say. Control just means having a power of influence, like that cowboy has, and that, and that power of influence being used to drive a process in a certain direction, like the cattle, towards the railhead, that is welcome to you, the controller. Now, the people would control government if they were capable of having an influence. And this capability of having an influence and this exercise, when appropriate, of that influence would keep government going in a direction, following a pattern that is welcome to those people. Otherwise, they'd give up, so to speak, uh, exercising that influence, pushing the process in that direction, the people pick up and drive it. So that's what I mean by people controlling up. Now, the second element in my long sentence uh, is that the people should control government, people should control government collaboratively and inclusively if democracy is going to be attractive. Now, by collaboratively, I mean that they've got, in some sense, to do it together. We, the people, if I can use the the, in any country, have got, in some collaborative sense, to be in control of government, to be exercising influence over government that will ideally drive government in a welcome direction. OK, now, what might it be to um, to, to act collaboratively in that way. Well, you know, think about people on a beach, and there's a swimmer in difficulty. And someone says, you know, they, everyone notices the swimmer, you know, waving and obviously in trouble in the water. And at that point, people also, they get to be aware that everyone wants the swimmer to be saved. They become aware, because no one offers, that no one on their own can save the swimmer. Uh, they all become aware, though, that they together can save the swimmer. Maybe because somebody shouts out, let's form a chain, you know, linking hands. And they're aware now at this point that they together, and only they together, can save the swimmer. And they're aware of a plan under which they can do that. And maybe the plan gets put into action.
because somebody runs to the water and says, come on, come on, grip my hand. You know, they form a chain into the water. Now that's a case of people acting together to realize a certain goal to save the swimmer. And they do so as far as there's a plan of action they're all aware of, and they're all willing to take part in, in order to secure a result that, as they all know, they each want to secure. That would be a case of doing something collaboratively. Now, I want to say, and I will qualify in a moment before you all start, start laughing, I want to say that people in a democracy, ordinary people in a democracy, ideally should be collaboratively acting under a plan that keeps government going in a direction where they want it to go. They're going to, that's the way in which ideally they should control. So no one is left out, as in anyone on the beach can join in that, you know, um, in, the, in the chain. Equally, everybody should have access to whatever mode of action is going to have the effect of keeping government on track, on a welcome track. Okay, now, as I say, before you start laughing, I want to immediately add, there are ways in which people act together that aren't wholly cooperative, like the case of the beach. So, for example, suppose we're all playing a football match. You know, we all say, let's play a football game, you know, divide into teams, got a ball. Okay, so why do we do that? Maybe this is a schoolroom, I'm the teacher, and we say, okay, well, let's we've had enough of this, let's go and play football, make teams, and so on. Well, we do that presumably because there is a goal that we want in common to achieve, which is to have fun, right. to enjoy a football game. Okay, but notice that that higher level shared goal presupposes a lower level competition. Because we've got to go out there in these two different teams, and we've each really got to try to win, you know? And in fact, it won't be much fun if one team says, oh, let the other team win, you know? It's like playing a game of tennis or whatever. There's nothing so irritating as playing someone <laughs> who's letting you win, you know, and saying the ball was in when it was out and so on, because they're being nice to you. For God's sake, I know you're better than me, but play seriously, you know? It's no fun otherwise. Okay, so some ways in which people act together involves what I think of as cooperative competitive action. You know, it's got cooperative ultimate telos, but it nests or includes a competitive element. <clears throat> and I want to say that Given the fact that the reason you might have laughed at my beach analogy is that we all know that politics is essentially involves competing interests because we all have different views on a range of matters. And we all have, many of us have, very different interests on a range of matters. As Jeremy Waldron says somewhere, the circumstances of politics are the circumstances of disagreement. Disagreement is of the nature of politics. Now, given that's the case, it's like the football game. If we're going to together control government, we have to do it, so to speak, in a way that allows for this competition at a lower level. And of course, that directs you now to a possible sort of plan. And the plan, whereby you might control government, the plan will involve a framework like the rules of the football game, you know, the rules that tell you what's a goal, how to score, what's a foul, etc. They involve rules, a common framework of rules, under which we compete. We compete to get our ideas followed by government, our interests responded to by government. We each compete, recognizing that there are these in interests. But of course, we compete in that way also recognizing there's a lot of common interest. The common interest is in the shared framework, right? We want government to be 
controlled in a certain way that we all agree on. We should be convened, but only under that framework. So we together would be acting collaboratively in imposing that framework on whoever is in government and however they act, while competing, so to speak, in determining within the limits of the framework for how exactly they're going to behave. That's what I think of as the collaborative nature of democracy. It essentially involves a common framework. We, the people, we ordinary people, what can impose on government while allowing that there's competition between us at a lower level. Now, it's important that we control government in that way, not just collaboratively, so that no one is left out. But we do so in a way that's also inclusive. Everybody is included. No one is left out. And how do you achieve that? Well, a system will involve us together controlling government in a way that no one is left out. If everyone is in a position, I would say, to feel that they are respected as an equal with other people in the society. What does it mean to be respected as an equal? Well, I'll give you a little test, so to speak, of whether people in a system of together controlling government are competing with one another, a test as to whether or not that system might be regarded as a system in which everyone can believe rightly that they are respected as an equal. And the test is this. Suppose that the government made decisions under this sort of system of influence from the people. It made decisions, but for, and the system really gave everyone an equal share in trying to influence government, and the system took account of the interest of each appropriately. I think in that case, that even if the government brought in a law under this system, that you would prefer it didn't bring in. A law that, for example, builds the factory in your backyard. Do you know what I mean? I mean, like a policy decision. A law that, for example, introduces immigration controls that do not favor people in your particular ethnic group, for example or linguistic group or something. If the system really respected everyone as equals, then even, suppose you're one of these people, even if the government brings in an unwelcome law, and some laws will be unwelcome to everybody. I mean, there'll be, sorry, there'll be somebody for whom any law is unwelcome, right, in a system of disagreement. <coughs> the test is this. Can you feel, with even such an unwelcome law, that while you wish, while you're disappointed that it was brought in, you recognize that it isn't the work of an alien despot that was imposed on you. It was brought in under a system where you had an equal place. If you could feel that, if you could feel with an unwelcome decision that it was just tough luck that the decision went that way. It wasn't that the powers that be are against you are against people in your religion, are against people in your region, are against people of your language, are against people of your opinions. If you could feel that it wasn't because of there being a will that in that sense is, is an independent alien will that's in power, but simply because that's how the system worked, a system in which you have an equal part, then I would say you should feel included. Our system of democracy should be both on a collaborative basis, and it should be inclusive in that sense. OK, so what now would give people, ordinary people, control over government of that collaborative, inclusive sort? Well, I think there are two broad requirements, and the second requirement divides in two. The two broad requirements are, first of all, that the framework under which different groups compete to influence government that it's a framework that people control. They could change that framework if they wish. It's their framework, okay? 
So, for example, there has to be a possibility for ordinary people of changing the constitution, as you might say. But I think a framework is including more than is going to appear in a written constitution, including also conventions of government, including institutions in place, and so on. People have to be capable of changing that constitution. Else, it's going to be an imposition on them, isn't it? Whoever invented it in the first place, maybe an earlier generation, is going to be like a despot in relation to people at a given time, unless they, at a given time, can change it. There are two respects, though, in which they should not be able to change it. And those are, again, um, they should not be able to change it so that some people lose citizenship, some people are thrown out. Because then, of course, that wouldn't be a framework for collaborative, inclusive control of a government. And they shouldn't be able to change it so that some people had less power. Their vote, say, was le worth less than the vote of others. That, again, would be inconsistent with the aim of the system. But they should be able to change it in other respects in respect of the exact, say, electoral system you have, in change in terms of the exact constitution constraints on government that you have, um, change it, for example, in respect of, to take, um, it wasn't a constitutional change, but in a way it was a change of framework, the law that Zapatero brought in under which homosexual marriage became legitimate, Spanish legislature was the third of the world to introduce such a law. And many, many we countries. Thought we were the first. Oh, you were the third. Oh, right. <laughs> third is not bad. Uh, third is it's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> but that was a major change of framework. Uh, so there ought to be a possibility of changing frame, framework you know, on the people's part, or else they're not really going to exercise democratic control over government. But I want to say one thing here, which is that with at least many elements in the framework, it should not be too easy to change the framework. Because after all, remember I said democracy is competitive one level and cooperative at the next level. Well, here there's always a danger, which is, let's say, one party wins power, like in Hungary, uh, by majority voting. That's maybe fine for elections. But then the let's suppose the constitution can be changed by majority vote that easily, or changed by the legislature. Well, then the legislature, the party having been elected, can change the very framework so as to favor itself the next time round in the election, or to favor itself in all sorts of other ways. Or the majority that support that government, if it's a majority referendum, can equally be persuaded to change the framework to suit their side of politics. And there's always going to be a danger in democratic competition that one or the other side is going to be tempted to try to change the framework if it's too easy to change the framework so as to suit their side in politics. So I think while the people should have control over the framework, for at least various aspects of the framework, and we can maybe talk about those later, it should be non-majoritarian control. It should require maybe 55% rather than 50% of the public <coughs> referendum. Or there should be two referenda, you know, when it, the first introduces a major change, the second is a reconsideration of it. There are all sorts of ways, but it should be qualified. That's why, for example, and I wrote about this <clears throat> prior to recent events, I think it was terrible that Britain should be able to leave the common market on which so many people had invested their lives just on the basis of an up-down 50-50 vote that happened to suit one party because it had a party problem. Cameron had a problem with the UKIP members. So he puts it up for 50 It's like a toss of a coin. You know, he's a gambler. And my goodness me, that country has torn itself apart as a result of allowing so easily a change of having become really part of a constitution or a quasi-constitution. <coughs> okay, so I said there are two requirements for popular control. One is that people control the framework. They've got 
power over the framework, as you might say. But the other requirement is that under the framework, within the framework, people also retain a lot of control. You see, you could have the second, you could have this possibility. It's sort of outlandish, but you could have this possibility that you've got a system of control, a framework in, in place, that says there shall be an absolute monarch uh, whose ex and ex's, you know, heir, for example, you could have an hereditary monarchy with absolute monarchy, where people do have the capacity to change the framework and move to, for example, a democracy of some kind. And, but they, you know, they can change the framework, they have control over the framework, but they have no control under the framework, because within the framework, the monarch has all the control. So you also need for a democracy, because of course, if you had that system, then the monarch itself would have too much discretion and power, uncontrolled by the people. You have to have control under the framework as well as over the framework. And there are two aspects to this requirement of control. The people should have under the framework selectional control, I'm going to call it, and operational control over what happens in government. So let me move on to that. And that's section three and four in the handout. And I'm going to go a little bit more quickly so as to end on the hour. I'm sorry for speaking for an hour, but I'm trying to think of it slowly because I'm painfully aware of how difficult it is to follow philosophy in the second language. Uh, so okay. you take an extra 10 minutes or so? Well, I'll try to end on the hour. There about, there's only so much, you know, I'll be very full of sleep. Um, I'm reminded of a, a poem of T.S. Eliot's talking about Bertrand Russell, the philosopher. And in that poem he says, like horses' hooves over dry turf, his voice devoured the afternoon. <laughs> I wouldn't want to, to devour the morning, you know. <laughs> okay, so selectional constraints. Well now, that means bears on People could have control over government, could have influence over government of the kind you might expect to shape government in a direction welcome to the people, insofar as they can determine who is in office under the framework. And now there are two sorts of officers that are important in government. One is what I call a domain general office or authority, and the other I call a domain specific authority. Now, the domain general authorities or officers in government are, of course, the legislators. It's domain general because people elect, people selected for this role, there isn't just a specific task they have to do. There are a whole lot of tasks because making laws involves making laws now in one area, now in another area, now of a high generality, now of very local generality. And really the executive authorities who implement those laws, choosing the exact policies under which to implement or apply the laws, they also have a domain general sort of power or authority. So one the question is, how are people going to select those who will occupy domain general offices? And the other question is, how are people going to select those who occupy domain-specific authorities? Now, domain-specific authority, for example, would be judicial authority. If you think of judges, what they do is determine whether, in a given case, the government or an individual or a group broke the law, right, as the law. So their job is to interpret the law and to determine whether or not the law under that interpretation was actually broken by somebody who's brought before the courts. That's the main specific task that a judge or a court has. Equally, the tasks of a police force in monitoring, you know, whether the law is broken, or of prosecutors in bringing people before the courts. Those are also domain-specific 
offices of government, and very much part of government. Okay, the main general authorities, but how should they be selected? Now, I th I'm all for elections at this point. I think elections are really very, very important. I actually think they're really important because of the connection with what I'm going to describe as operational constraints. So for example, the operational constraints of government to, inter to participate are going to involve the fact that we can speak up freely against government, the fact that we can associate you know, together freely in order to form a new party or a protest movement or whatever against <coughs> government. The fact that we can get freedom of information on what government is doing. These are really important operational constraints I'll discuss in a moment. But having elections whereby you get open, periodic, competitive elections between different sides, that means there's going to be a ritual every few years in which those particular freedoms are asserted by people, right? And that ritualistic assertion of those freedoms is really important to preserving those freedoms. And those freedoms, to anticipate the operational constraints, are really important in keeping government on track. So elections are they're really the best way I know of you know, uh, activating those sorts of constraints on government. Are they the best way of picking? those who actually will occupy office in government? Do, <laughs> they're probably not. I'm sure that you would pick much better people you know, to act in government by means of, probably even by means of a lottery. <laughs> as, as someone said about, uh, um, I don't know, a senator from Texas who was running for the presidency uh, someone who had been his, uh, who had been his uh, roommate in Princeton University when he was an undergraduate there, he said, I prefer to pick someone from the phone book than have him as president. <laughs> and you might think there are very different ways, probably much better ways of picking people in office. But there's no way of picking people in office that will activate all that sort of public you know, assertion of the right of association, freedom, opposition, the right to information about what's going on in public and so on. So that's where elections are really important. People sometimes think democracy, well, if it's good, it must be because it gets the best people into power. I thought you could not defend democracy on those grounds. Let's face it, I think, I think I'm no fan of Xi, Xi Jinping, and Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping. Uh, but, but I actually think he's probably a much more reliable governor than Donald Trump is, for example, uh, even though he's not selected in a way. But man, the selection system in China is scarcely one that activates all of those other constraints of freedom of association, expression, and, and the public opinion, you know? And so I much prefer elections, even though it gives me a Donald Trump rather than a Xi Jinping, right? Um, so I think that's really the main thing that's to be said in favor of, of elections. And remember, those in power, they're going to be really disciplined, if system is working well, by the framework that's agreed upon, you know? And actually, they're also going to be disciplined, that's the good thing about elections, by the fact that they almost always want to keep power, for whatever reason, to be re-elected, and that sort of will just keep them on their toes, do you know what I mean? So it's also a bit of a check on those in power. Okay, how about the domain specific authorities? Well, interestingly, in order to have elections, you have to have an election commission. You've got to have people who have a domain specific task, which is to make sure the rules governing selection of the domain general authorities by election are actually applied, and to make sure that the districts, the boundaries, the areas, that they're not gerrymandered. You know that expression, they're not sort of warped to, thwart, to, to favor one party over another. But of course, those people should not be the same people who are being elected. They have to be, in any sensible system, independent authorities with this domain specific task. How should they be selected? 
well, I think they should not be elected, because if they were elected, they'd be party people, and the party would elect the people they want, and you know, basically the system would collapse. They have to be independent. That means if they can't be elected, they have to be appointed. Presumably, they're going to be appointed by those who are elected to the main general office, like the legislators and the executive. How do we keep control over that? Well, by making sure, first of all, that the appointment system is transparent, as in we get information about what's happening, what the candidates are, etc. By making sure that the, um, there are rules for their appointment, criteria that are fulfilled, by making sure that the task these people are given is designated as carefully as possible so that they can't abuse it in the interest of any particular group. And by making sure ultimately that even those in those domain specific offices can be appealed against and contested, maybe in parliament by opposition, maybe by the people as a whole because of freedom of information about how they're operating. Those controls are also popular controls. They're just as much popular controls as are electoral controls. I would say the same about the appointment of judges, for example. The same about the appointment of public prosecutors. And the same about the appointment of various other officers, we'll come to in a moment, like auditors, like statisticians general, Bureau of Statistics that gives information like bodies that give information on the economic data in a country so that we know, for example, the Kirshner government or a Kirshner-like government has just been re-elected in Argentina. One thing that's really worrying, I mean, I'm center-left as well as they claim to be, one thing that's terrifying about that government in its last incarnation was that it would not have an independent source of economic data to the point where they churned out their own data, and of course it always looked great, but to the point where the United Nations authorities never accepted those data. They began to just leave a blank space. The people did not have control as far as they didn't have reliable data of that kind. Okay, so selection of authorities, that's one means whereby ordinary people who've got equal access to elections, for example, and equal access to contesting if they wish in the papers or whatever, the, those in domain specific offices, uh, whereby people can exercise influence and control over government. What about the operational constraints? Well, I think it would be a very bad mistake to think that democracy was just about how we appoint to government, and even worse to think it was just about how we appoint to the main general offices in government, and even worse again to think that it was just about majority control of who's in without any other controls on who's elected. There are also operational constraints that are imposed under a framework of any working half-decent democracy. And they come in really three sorts. I'm going to do this now quite quickly. I call them, in alliteration in English, constraints of containment, constraints of consultation, and constraints of contestation. Constraints of containment. Well, what constraint on those in government, of course it applies in most places, is a constraint of residency. You know, that you actually live under the laws that you bring into being. You know, the big complaint of the Americans in 1776 was that those who imposed taxes on them did not have to live under those taxes. Those who imposed laws on them did not have to live on, under those laws, that's to say from Westminster. Residency is very important. But apart from that, there are, let's say there are three rules that I think are important as operational constraints <coughs> in the decent democracy. First of all, a rule of law that says you've got a rule by law, and by law that is constructed so as to be fairly determinate, so that people know what the law is, and can rely on the law being applied to them in the same way as applied to others. Now that means that puts a lot of constraints on the sorts of laws that the legislature can introduce. It also puts a lot of constraints on how the judiciary can behave in interpreting those laws, or the administration can behave in interpreting those laws. Apart from the rule of laws, there's the rule of 
I should might call it the rule of checks or checks and balances. Because I would say in a decent and in all parliamentary democracies as well, you have an independent judiciary, for example. That's a, that means the judiciary you're going to check if they're really independent, they're really appointed so that party favorites can't be put in office, then they're a real check on government. But equally, if you insist on there being two chambers of the legislature, they're a check on one another. Or if you have a system under which there are independent auditors that keep the books, independent statisticians that give the data, independent source of economic data, independent ombudsman, you know, who can bring complaints against government. These are all checks on government. And man, they're so important in making sure that government is influenced by the people's framework, a framework they can change and therefore impose it under this framework. It's really important for keeping them on a track that answers to the people's wishes, ordinary people's wishes. The third rule is a rule of reasons, as I call it. So part of having a shared framework is that when we argue competitively, whether in the legislature or in elections, about what changes should be made or whatever, we have to refer back to the institutions we have, for example. But more important even than that, we have to, whenever we give an argument, we have to follow what I think of as the fundamental rule in any democratic framework, and I haven't mentioned that up to now, which is that when you put forward an argument for going with one policy rather than another, having a law of this kind rather than a law of that kind, even having these people in government rather than having those people in government. You always appeal to reasons or considerations <coughs> that everyone can regard as relevant. Now, some people may regard some considerations that may weight them more than others, but at least all must be prepared to regard them as relevant. So you're considering, let's say, a health system, whether to have a public option as it's called, you know, the mixed private and public health system, or a public only, as in Canada, or a private only, as almost effectively, well, not quite so happily, but as a lot of people seem to want in the United States, right? And, I mean, arguing for the private only, you can't stand up and say, this would be really good for the doctors. I mean, they'd get really rich. You know, that's, that's why we want, I mean, that's not relevant you know, on all sides. But if you say, now this system would mean you get a better quality of medical provision. Everyone can see that as relevant, right? But on the other side, someone say, well, you might get a higher quality at the top, but it would be very unequal. Everyone can see that as relevant too. So the rule of reasons basically says you've got to give reasons for your decisions in office, but equally in arguing for a policy in public, that everyone can see as relevant. That's a real constraint of containment sort on those in government. The other operational constraints are, and there are more even than constraints of consultation. Now, governments have always, democratic government, recognized this, if only by means of polling, or by means of white papers. I, don't, I can't remember whether Spain has this system, you know, whereby government publishes a white paper with proposals inviting consultation from different groups. I'll just mention though, there is a new system of public consultation that I think is really important potentially for democracy and should be introduced everywhere. And that is what I think of as a citizen's assembly. One that Ireland used, for example, before the uh, referenda on uh, abortion. A uh, citizen's referendum involves taking a statistical sample, so statistically representative of the people. Maybe in Ireland it was 100 people. In British Columbia, which had a citizen's assembly some years earlier, um, you know that province of Canada was 200 people. And you bring them together, you invite them by phone, and they have to agree to join up. And if someone says no, you find someone who corresponds in category to them so as to keep it statistically representative. And these people meet every weekend over a period, or every second weekend, or a weekend every month. 
They hear both sides of every argument, or of the argument they're considering, and they then come up with a judgment. There may be two judgments, a majority and a minority one. But the thing is, it's really feeding back to government a sense of what ordinary people would think about this or that change of law or policy, were they fully informed about it and had the chance to think about it. And of course, if it's followed by a referendum, as in the Irish case, that can inform you know, other members of the public you know, who can often think, well, you know, I haven't really thought about this, but you know, I'm really influenced by the fact that people like me in the society, after a lot of thought, were convinced this was the proper way to go. And it can lead people to go, that's a, that's a, a, a would be a constraint of consultation forced on government. If government had to go through that process for any major, certainly for any change of constitution or a change of major law, that would also be a, what I call an operational constraint of government, a constraint on their operation between elections. And the third sort of, actually the most important of all, is that there has to be a power of public contestation. That means that the public are kept informed, it presupposes a free press, it presupposes freedom of association and speech, of course. It presupposes a populace in which there is a degree of vigilance about what is happening in government, and a degree of awareness and concern. And it presupposes a willingness on the part of people to take government to court, whether in groups or singly, to write to the press, to take part in the media, and of course, to take part in more pop on the streets as well. In particular, I would say, to take part in non-governmental organizations, which divide up that civic labor of contestation, examining government in its different aspects, and challenging government in the open, on open grounds. Now, NGOs are very different from private lobbies. Private interest lobby groups always campaign, first of all, on private grounds of their interest, not public interest, and always privately, not publicly. NGOs have to contest publicly and on public grounds. That means by the rule of common reasons that I just mentioned. Now, those operational constraints would combine, ideally, with selectional constraints to impose a lot of discipline on government, on how government is formed and how government performs, how it actually uh, does in legislating and in operating the system of rule over the people. And people would have equal access to it insofar as they've got, well, it's not relevant containment rules so much, uh, but they've got equal access to election and to contestation. And of course, via the, um, and, to uh, and to contestation and consultation and under the containment rules, to ombudsmen, for example, and channels like that of indirect public protest. Okay, finally, what's the point of the system? What's so good about democracy? I said it certainly can't be recommended on the grounds it always gives us the best people in power. Would that it did, you know. But that's a Hail Mary aspiration. I think the experience now after 200 years of democracy is that it often doesn't get us the best people in power, but by goodness, it gets people in power who are going to be controlled by us, by us ordinary people. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means if the controls are really effective, those factors I've mentioned, the framework being controlled and rule under the framework being controlled, it means that they cannot behave at their discretion <coughs> in government. They make decisions, and of course, there's a degree of discretion, but the discretion, the exercise is hedged in all the time. Hedged in, of course, even electorally by the prospect of uh, not being re-elected, and hedged in under the containment rules, under the consultation rules, under the con uh, and under the consultation rules, that they operate in a straitjacket, so to speak, under popular control. That's really what democracy is about. And that means that the will of government, reflected in how government operates in making laws, making international relations, making policy, uh, implementing the laws, applying them, right down to the offices of the judiciary, the police force, 
right down through all of the offices of government, the statistical offices, the information bearing offices, the media. It means that this government is our government in a sense. Now it does not mean that any one of us in any single party or any interest group or opinion group get to control government. No, no. We'll, talk, we'll all be frustrated in a way under democracy. We're all destined to fail some of the time in getting our ideas into power. But the whole point about democracy is precisely that, that each individual be protected against democracy and against government in the sense of knowing they live under a government that is so constrained that everyone is respected as an equal, themselves included. That does not mean that they're going to be satisfied with everything government does. Many of its laws are going to be very unwelcome, particularly if the other lot were in power. But at least you recognize that what laws go through are laws that have been brought in under a system of selection and operation that is responsive equally to you with others. And you can think ideally, ideally only, of those laws, not that they're welcome, they won't be welcome, often, but at least that they're not laws that you should resent as the work of an alien will, like a colonial power or an elite group, or, you know, uh, the oligarchs, so to speak, that are controlling what's really happening. The ideal is you should at least be free, free of that. And you should, within the system, of course, be able to keep pushing for your point of view, you know? But the irony is that in democracy, while well, you keep pushing for your point of view, <coughs> you're persuaded of it. Hope you come to say, you do so, of course, under the rule of reasons and under the framework itself. You, together with even the opposition, are really the ones who are controlling government, and that's what's the important thing. So there are two levels at which you're going to be concerned if you're a concerned citizen in government. One is you're going to be concerned that it is a democratic system, in my sense, of being fully reflective of the position, the stance, the status <coughs> of everyone in the society equally with others. That's the democratic concern. But you're also going to be concerned of, you're going to have concerns of, say, social justice, which may be different from others' interpretation of social justice, that you're going to battle for, you know, under that system. Now, I describe this as a Republican view of democracy. Well, it's Republican in, in two senses, that are in three senses. Uh, Republicanism has three elements. I've got to stop now, and I have got the... Oh, we have to go through time. those three elements. Oh, okay, sure, very briefly. This, I, I really am going to stop now after this. First element is the conception of freedom under which you're unfree if there's a discretionary power over you even if you like the way it's exercising the power. You know, uh, you, some of you have read Just Freedom. Um, Nora, in the marriage with Torvald, Torvald gives her everything she wants. But of course, she has everything she wants only at his discretion. So she's unfree in relation to Torvald. We would be unfree in relation to government. All of us, or at least those of us in a certain sector, if that government had discretion, you know, to treat us in a way that didn't respect us all as equals with others. And it's that discretion that we're trying under a democratic system to constrain, right? Second element of republicanism is belief in the mixed constitution. A belief precisely in what I would call democracy, but Hobbes and, and uh, uh, Baudin would not have called democracy. It's a belief that you have to have different centers of power that check and balance one another, like the judiciary and the legislature, like the auditors general, the statisticians general, the economic data, the media, and those in government. You've got to have that mixture. That was the second element in <coughs> republicanism, going right back to, uh, to Republican Rome. It's the thing that most celebrated by Polybius, the founder of the Republican tradition, in a way. And the third element in Republican, Republicanism is that ordinary people 
well, it's often summed up as the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, that ordinary people have to be engaged with politics. That doesn't mean going to meeting after meeting after meeting. It just means keeping yourself informed and being prepared to support this or that NGO, for example, and certainly being prepared to vote, you know? That ordinary people can't be apathetic, you know, they must be active. And this image of democracy, of course, gives people a big role, not in being the lawmakers, but in being the law testers, the law checkers, not just the law takers either. So in that sense, this picture of democracy is meant for me it represents a system under which there would not be public domination because the government would not have discretion, free discretion over us or over any sector amongst us. And it'd be a system under which there is decentralization of control, the mixed constitution, and a system under which we as citizens would have a mini aspected role, you know, both in electing and in contesting and in keeping the rest of the so that is finally the end. I'm sorry for going on so long. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I want to remind you who are here that you want a resume of this conference in Spanish that circulate estas hojas o handouts, me parece que hay una, hay una, hay una, hay una carpeta con unas cuantas copias al fondo de la sala. Entonces, si no lo tenéis a mano y queréis consultar el resumen en español de la conferencia, haceros con, con las hojas al fondo de la sala. Y ahora lo que vamos a hacer es proceder a, una, a un breve debate, que no podrá ser mucho más de media hora, eh, en el que se invitan preguntas de la audiencia que bueno, tendría que ser en principio en inglés si alguien quiere preguntar algo en español yo puedo intentar hacer ahí una traducción un tanto pedestre eh, y, y, y un poco debatir con, con Philip sobre estas nuevas ideas que nos ha presentado Así que bueno, paso a hablar en inglés ya digo que se aceptan preguntas si es necesario en, en castellano y yo las intentaré so um, uh, I, I'm opening the floor to, to, to questions and, and a little bit of debate um, on this uh, a bunch of new uh, thoughts I gather on the selection or an operational constraints of um, living under the rules concept of democracy. Um, and I maybe uh, would like to start by asking you a question. I'll take questions. Just raise your hand when you want to ask me to ask a question, and I'll write down uh, names. Um, so one thing that came up in the reading group that we've been having the last few weeks, and that I think is prominent in what you've said today, and that we. Uh, found that we wanted to ask him to tell us more about is um, the conception of rationality that underpins the whole account. And, and let me tell you why, why we found that was an interesting topic. The fundamental ro rule of, uh, of democracy, as you call it, um, so you put it very much at the heart of your account of civic republicanism and democracy in a civic republican um, framework. That the reasons given by government for, instance, for introducing laws be those that everyone can regard as rational. And um, one wonders what will happen under this republican model of democracy when the rules of reasoning themselves come under contestation or are disputed. So, interestingly enough, you today gave us a, a, an example of the kinds of rules that you may have in mind when you describe the list and petit um, instance, right? Um, so we vote in that P, a law that says P, you shall not steal private property. And then we vote in that Q, um, you shall not uh, murder. 
but then we're unable to agree on the law that says you shall not steal and murder, um, um, which is contradictory. But somebody may just say, well, so much the worse for the principle of no contradiction. It's been voted down. Um, and so, because democracy prevails over logic, and so from that point onwards, where does that leave the fundamental um, rule of democracy? And how is it possible that we give reasons that are relevant to each other if there is a basic failure of agreement on the basic rules of, of inference? Okay, so I think there are so a number of things to say. One is that what I call common reasons, uh, considerations we all regard as relevant, um, may be considerations that later generations may come to think of as misconceived, you know, as considerations we should not have been moved by. Um, so, uh, so for example, in the, say, United States, given its history, a consideration that is certainly we regard as relevant on all sides is that every state should have equal representation. Now, of course, when that rule was introduced and canonized in the fact that each state has got two senators representing it, the states were more or less of the same size. I mean, there were differences, but not enormous. But now you've got Rhode Island, you know, which is you know, maybe 100,000 residents, and you've got California, which is the fifth biggest economy in the world in itself, and got a population of millions, tens of millions, each having two. Now, that's a very bad uh, precedent, but it's sort of written in. But it's still a rule of you know, reasons within the system. So they're not always the most, so to speak, um, appropriate of reasons. They're historically shaped sometimes. So I don't mean, when I said there should be considerations, you should be restricted to invoking considerations you can expect all sides to regard as relevant. I should have added, in view of the history, so the may not always be. So that's a contrast between common reasons in my sense, for example, and public reasons in Rawls' sense. Because Rawls regards public reasons as both reasons that are shared by everybody and that ought to be shared by everybody. You know, he's got two horses, and he's riding both horses, and they're going to come apart, you know? One is the shared reasons, and the other is the right reasons. Because the reasons that are shared may not be the right reasons always. I see the reason about the states is not, in one sense, the right reason. Okay, the second thing to say is that um, privileging reasons in this way is independent from, I think, uh, the issue you raised about how um, how we should um, how we should aggregate votes. In, for example, the example that, that you gave. Um, so, for example, you could require of people that they follow the rule of common reasons without yet having a requirement about how the decisions to which those reasons lead them ought to be aggregated. For example, in considering whether to uh, whether to uh, reduce taxes, there may be all sorts of considerations in play, and people reach that decision, and then all sorts of relevant considerations may be in play, and only those in reaching the decision to raise defence spending. Right? And then we've got another decision whether or not to, to raise other spending, um, and again common reasons only may be introduced. And you could have the group voting for hold taxes, raise defense spending, raise other spending, and don't borrow or go into debt. You know, and that's inconsistent, right? I mean, in, in the real world. But they've still followed the rule of common reasons. So the rule of common reasons is independent, I would say, from the other issue. So OK, finally, on the other issue, why is it important that in aggregating votes, in making decisions, we make sure that we don't have contradictory decisions? Well, I would say it's important because imagine you're, think of yourself vis-a-vis -vis government, 
And you, you want to know where you stand with the law, right? And this government, they keep churning out laws, let's suppose, by majority voting. And now they churn out two inconsistent laws. And you realize, well, if I do this, I'll break that law. If I do that, I'll break that law, right? There's no way I can avoid breaking the law. You can't be, you're going to be, that's going to be a discretionary problem over you. I mean, as governments have, I remember visiting European University in, in uh, St. Petersburg some years back, where there is a Republican group, actually. And uh, they just had an issue, the government didn't like them, because they were independent of government. So one branch of government had dictated that uh, they had to change the whole building structure because of fire regulations. But another branch of government had ordained that they didn't touch anything because of heritage regulations, right? So they were being told by government, you know, to, they, there was nothing they could do. Basically, it was an attempt to shut them down, of course, you know. You can't do, you've got to, if government can produce inconsistent decisions, and you can't say, hey, that's inconsistent, you know, you've got to straighten this out, then, you know, you're, a, you're completely at their power, at their mercy. That's why it's really important that you have that sort of rationality and decision making in the centers of power. So the paradox that is involved there is that it may look like the most democratic way of making decisions regarding our rules, in fact, hands in um, enormous amounts of power to the government of that. Absolutely. And so, so that's a paradox. Yeah. I would about say, what looks most democratic is in fact least democratic. Well, I would say we're the majoritarian way of making up decisions, I wouldn't call it the democratic yeah. way, so, is actually very undemocratic because it's going to mean that ordinary people living under such a pattern of decision making are going to live under yeah. a government which they can't hold accountable because they hold accountable to contest, you know, the whole notion of contestability involves accountability. You've got to be dealing with an agent that is subject to the law of non-contradiction and acknowledges the law of non-contradiction. I have two questions which are very different. I can say the second one or depending on how we or the other one or, or I will so then depending on the that's okay. The first question is on the unelected uh, representative. Yeah. A favorite example in Spain at least is Central Bank Good. One of the actual vice presidents of the European Central Bank was a former Minister of Economy in Spain and he says he has a much greater power in the Central Bank than as an economy minister in so my suspicion, or my question is that couldn't, can't some of these unelected uh, institutions or representatives, <coughs> such as this one or other, uh, sometimes we talk about Supreme Court uh, also that are not under the electoral cycles. Can, can we see them, in fact, as undemocratic principles? Is there not, are they not a way of democracies to protect themselves from democracy? Right, good. Think they can be seen, in a sense, as technocratic principles yeah. for the good of democracy. And as you say, of course, very briefly, in the course of your and out, they are indicative of our interests. Ideally. Ideally, it sounds a bit wishful thinking. I think they are there in order to show us or in order to take, make decisions that we would not trust ourselves to make or even we would not trust our governments to make. In a sense, they could be seen as uh, an undemocratic 
principal with a little bit different rationale. They are like the fo fourth power, apart from the executive, to the chief the judiciary, in, in a sense. And in the last decade, there has been a big discussion of technocracy and democracy, precisely of this form. So I don't know if you could. OK, no, I, I do have things to say on that. I mean, I think it's really important to see that domain-specific, unelected authorities are part of the democratic system. I mean, otherwise, you're going to say, well, there's the democratic system, and then there's that law. Now, who are they? Imagine, well, they're the elite, you know, who control these, or they're the technocrats or whatever. And really, it's democracy versus technocracy, right? And of course, in that rhetorical battle, democracy is always going to win. And if that's been exiled from democracy, that's going to mean democracy in the purely electoral, even majoritarian sense is going to win. In the sense that people say, oh yeah, democracy, we should be electing these people. Or they should be you know, not unelected the way they are. Or they should have no power at all. But for example, you know, the Kirshner government, uh, just to take it to a moderate example, not an extreme example, uh, denied, the, um, denied the Economic Data Office um, independent power. They took that over. They were elected. And so what did they do? They issued data that's just bent in their favor. That doesn't help ordinary people. And it would be sort of absurd to think of that as a democratic be taking over a function rather than leaving it to the technocrats. That you had a technocratic body, you know, assuming it was properly appointed, properly constrained, you know, and subject to contestation, is actually essential to having ordinary people exercise control over those that they elect. So I want to see those constitutional authorities, you know, those non-unelected authorities, as part of the overall democratic package. And I want to say that, well, first of all, the power should be limited. That's why I stressed when I said they should have a very exact brief or task given to them. The criteria should be highly framed, you know, tightly framed, so as to constrain them on what they do. And they should be exposed to contestation. In Parliament, for example, they can be, and also in the public press, and of course in public life generally. So I not, don't want to give them, and maybe the central bank, maybe that comment suggests that the central bank has too much power. I mean, that's an open issue, I don't know. But I think it's important that the central bank does have independent power, because as we know, um, Ideally, at any rate, now with the euro, it's all shifted. But in the, I mean, I regret the euro myself, I have to say. I think it was a terrible mistake, the worst mistake the EU made. Um, but leaving that aside, in a single country, you know, with, as in Spain before the euro, or, or a country like Australia, or America for that matter, Central bank has got control over interest rates, and indirectly it's got control over inflation, how far there'll be inflation, and control over unemployment, you know, how far that because of. It's very hard to read the signs. But we all know that you push the interest rates in one direction, you can lead to escalating inflation. That's very bad for ordinary people, as we know. Push them in another way, though, and that's very bad for employment. That's really bad for ordinary people as well. So it's really important that you keep the you keep these things in balance. And that is to say, over a long haul, not over just the electoral cycle. Now the trouble with having elected domain general authorities able, say those in administrative office, to dictate what interest rates are going to be, therefore what inflation rates are going to be is that they're all too likely to be concerned only about the next three years, you know, until the next election comes Four up. years, yeah. Four, uh, four, yes, four years. Although these days it's every two years. 
Australia is centered in three years there. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, a period like that. And, and that's really very dangerous for ordinary people. And I would not want elected representatives who've got this powerful interest in re-election and you're making things cozy now to have power over that dimension of the life. I mean, it's like uh, we know, and you know, almost every decent financial analyst I know takes this line. Uh, we know under contemporary ways of governing corporations, the CEOs are allowed to take compensation in the current value of the shares of that corporation. And as people have pointed out time after time after time, that creates a huge incentive for the CEO and the board or whatever to raise the price of shares, say by buying back shares, and now, which they can then cash in, of course, you know, easily after leaving office. Rather than worry about the share price 10 years from now, which would lead to investment incentive rather than incentive to buy back shares. We'd be doing the same thing in government if we allowed the electoral authorities to control the central bank. On the other hand, it is really important that the central bank are not given unconstrained power. So I would say it's very important they're subject to, um, for example, interrogation in parliament, in public, uh, that they're subject to, of course, free information about what they're deciding, country in the press, in public life, conversation in the streets, if needs be, by NGOs and so on. I mean, these are all hemming in the central bank. So they do have power, though, invariably. But I'd much prefer that they have power under those constraints. Now, under those constraints, see, is the word that, that you use, because not everybody may, may know it. I like to say that we can think about the elected authorities, ideally, as responsive representatives, as in they're representing us, that's for sure, we appoint them to government, and they're supposed to be responsive to our preferences over who is to have office, right? And ideally to our interests. These other people we don't elect, so they're not responsive to us in that way. But ideally they should be appointed under such constraints and with such a specific task, <coughs> subject to such contestation by other bodies in government by the people and the press, that we can regard them as indicative representatives. Now, what's an indicative representative? It's a representative such that how they judge in a given issue is indicative of how we would judge of that issue. Did we have their expertise and their and their um, their their knowledge of the of the facts? They will be indicative of our views, if not responsive to our views. That's the ideal, though. I have to say, they fail in many ways. And uh, it's also interesting in Argentina, the central bank is also under the direct control of government now. That has been, in effect, is it accidental that it's had an inflation rate of, even under the last government, that tried to peel back of over 60%? I mean, 60% per, I mean, it's extraordinary, you know, so you take a loan out to buy something, and uh, you're going to be paying back each year 60% or so of that, that amount of money. It's not accidental that that's the inflation rate, and that does not serve ordinary people in Argentina. There's a book I should recommend by uh, an ex-Deputy Governor General of the Bank of England called Paul Tucker. Sir Paul Tucker actually is. Uh, who uses Republican ideas quite a lot. But he's written a book called Unelected Power. And uh, his is a set of criteria he thinks that these bodies should be subject to and controls they should be subject to. And I'm pretty well on, on uh, side with most of, of what uh, Paul uh, recommends in that book. It came out just last year. Thank you. Second question. Yeah. I love this. We leave that for later. Uh, Pablo. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for such an inspiring talk. Oh, it was so inspiring that I have uh, a, a thousand of questions to raise. I'm going to restrain myself. You mean to inspiring a lot of I'm not going to devour yeah. the rest of the time uh, for ah. the sake of the rest of the people to be able as well to, to comment on your, on your 
on your talk. So the first one has to do with the framework, the the depiction the, the of what, what I would deem as a uh, constitution of democracy, the rules that uh, are over us, and the way in which we can change them, right? So my first question would be whether some of those rules, we cannot change them at all by any means, not even by a strong majority of people. And the second one has to do with, um, well, you, uh, you just mentioned or put on the floor just one example or one instance, but I, I, maybe I missed uh, some others. And that is not throwing out the people. So not depriving of citizens of their condition of being part of the demo, right? What about some basic rights, some fundamental rights, such as the right not to be tortured, for example? And what about the configuration of the demos itself? What about some of the people wanting to leave the country and thereby depriving of their original citizenship to some of the, the demos. And the other question has this as sort of following up the, uh, the idea of public reason. So you said, for example, it wouldn't be relevant to say this healthcare reform is not possible or desirable uh, because it doesn't make uh, doctors to earn more money something like that. I, I think that's yeah, yeah. that's good. Well, I was thinking, well, maybe if there's a scarcity of doctors, that would be a good reason for, you know, uh, passing that law. Yeah. But maybe um, um, inspired by this, and you mentioned <coughs> uh, also the, the idea of public reason, maybe what is not uh, relevant is to invoke certain sources certain texts, like for example, if someone says, well, this is not a good idea because it covers this healthcare reform again. It covers uh, blood transfusion, transfusion, and this is uh, banned by my Bible, for example. Is that irrelevant in your sense? I suppose, uh, okay. Excellent question. So on the, on the first one, um, I think there should be, now I haven't worked this out, let me say, and there are probably lawyers among you who do a much better job working it out than I can, or ever could, but I, my sense is in the framework there ought to be three sorts of rules. I think there should be some unchangeable rules, and I think they should include, um, they should include a rule of law, you know, that rule has to be by law and subject to the constraints associated tradition with the rule of law. Okay? Another is that whatever the citizenry is, um, they should have um, they should have equal rights qua citizens, right? Um, and the third bears on who the citizens are, that they should certainly be inclusive of all the more or less permanent, you know, adult members of the society, right? Um, I think that those should not be changeable, uh, except as far as to be extended to include others, right? But that no group should be cut off without its, uh, without its agreement. I'm not saying its agreement is difficult because we're not group level, but anyhow. Um, Okay, so that's unchangeable. I think there ought to be um, changeable, but changeable only under you know non-majoritarian, uh, and that's a whole raft of rules. I would say, especially the rules that where different sides have a competitive interest in changing those rules in their favor. Right? They should be the ones that are hard to change. Right? Uh, then there should be ones that should be subject to change. I referendum. Okay. And this is very tricky. Uh, but I think that um, 
I mean, there are many matters of, that are really important in coordinating different sectors of the society that are called landmark laws, you know, even though they're not strictly in the Constitution. Um, yeah, uh, it's sort of hard to, I can see any example I give, you know, might be contestable in itself. Um, but here, let me raise a difficulty, I feel, and I really haven't seen a way around it. The, if a constitution has an element, this is not a complicated picture. I thought I had an easy answer, but it's, I don't. And uh, there are laws in constitutions, such as, well, Ireland had a constitutional prohibition against divorce, for example. Um, I mean, that was actually introduced by majority voting um, back in the 1980s, as a matter of fact, or maybe it's the 70s. Now, it'd be crazy, it seems to me, to require more than a majority to change that, right? Well, why so? Well, I think because uh, disallowing divorce hurts people, those who want to leave their marriages, and allowing divorce you know, under constraints, etc., and is presumably got to help people, you know? It's, and so it's restrictive of people not to allow divorce. I, I mean, you might require that both parties have to be agreeable, for example, but not to allow divorce, even if both parties are agreeable. That's just hurting people, right? So there I want to say it should be, that should be changed by, uh, by majority vote. On the other hand, um, I wouldn't want to be the case that you could introduce a constitutional ban on divorce, which is a constitution that doesn't have, have a ban like that. Would you be able to introduce a ban on, on divorce, even with both parties agreeing, by a majority vote? That would seem to be crazy. That really should be. So I have a problem here. In other words, I think that it's not the nature of an issue in itself, say, divorce is but it's an issue of what's in the Constitution and how individuals are hurt that determines. Now, can I just leave that as a problem with you? Because it's a problem. I'm not an expert in institutional design, but you can't do political philosophy without thinking about institutional legal design, constitutional design a little. And that is an issue in institutional design that my mind is not clear about at the moment. And I'd, I'd, love, I'd love help if I can come up for help. But I, okay, now you raised the question, I'm taking too long. You raised the question in relationship, in relation to the, um, about secession or the group to be, well, secession raises great difficulties because of course it's territorially bounded always and uh, people are attached to their locations, you know, to their locale. And if a given territory, I mean like Catalonia today, is divided on whether or not to secede, even if they could secede constitutionally, or even if the EU would accept them, which I don't think they would. I think the issue of, um, of secession is very, very difficult, because some people are going to be hurt, and other people are. And I certainly don't think it should be a majority referendum in a case like that. And I think, actually, in a case like that, and maybe we should have gradated, you know, graduated sort of referendum, it really should be a very tough referendum that would allow such a secession. I'm not talking about Spain now, but in any, in any country you imagine. Actually, a German scholar has written, a, uh, has written stuff on, on um, Republican theory and, and secession, which I think is quite interesting. He worked with me for a time in Princeton. But I, uh, I, I, it's, you know, there be tigers. It's very, very difficult to work out a but he had a set of criteria that did seem to me to be fairly appropriate. But they involve also reference to the level of discontent, the source of discontent, you know, the possibility of compensation for those who actually don't want to leave, you know, a whole range of things of, of, of that kind. What's his name? Um, you know, I'll tell you afterwards. Okay. That I'll you. Um, okay, on the torture one, now that's, a, that's a really interesting one now. So should we have a constitutional absolute ban on torture? Well, here's what the Israeli Supreme Court 
judged about 15 years ago. And they're a rather interesting case. They said it should be illegal, full stop, torture, even by state officials, right? But they recognize, of course, which is going to be true in some countries at some stages. Let's suppose it's true. Actually, I think it's probably not as true as some people assume it is. I mean, it's likely to be true. Which is that you really could extract information from someone if only you could apply some sort of torture. That might save hundreds, thousands of lives, you know? It's Madrid, 19, 2004, you know? This guy knows where the bomb was planted in the railway station, you know? And you could have gotten that information. Maybe that is true. It does seem sort of tough to rule that out completely, because you might have a scenario where that's so likely you get it, you know? You'd, um, so the so Israeli Supreme Court, what they said is, it should be against the law, maybe even against the Constitution, but it should be a defense in law on the part of a state official. I mean, not guaranteed of success, but a degree of defense that, look, I had information that really raised the probability that I would save hundreds of lives by applying this electric shock or whatever it might be by doing so then that should be defense. That always seemed to me, because this is a terribly hard issue again, but that always seemed to me not an unreasonable point of view to take, rather than saying that you can absolute ever, you know, so that you would never ever be able to do this. And of course, by, by means of that defense, you also do something, which is that, you know, we all know there are zealots and fanatics, and they will kill hundreds of people in the age of some crazy calls, um, if they know there's no possibility of their being tortured because of this absolute ban, you know, and then in a way that can give courage to someone who's, whereas if they know that capture they might be exposed to this, you know, at least on the Israeli time. So I'm just going to, it's an example of another issue, it's very, very difficult, you know, and I'm not an, a, an expert on by any means in constitutional design. I'm taking a look. Finally, just on the public reason, the doctor case, you know, what I had in mind is just saying, this is very good for the doctors. The question is, look, we have a shortage of doctors, and the only way of getting them is to increase the payment. We have to pay them more than the nurses. We've got some nurses or whatever, but very few doctors. And uh, I mean, that would be a reason in, that everyone would see as relevant, you know? Mm -hmm. And equally in the religion case, you know, uh, I say, I don't want this law because it's against my religious no text, the Bible, the Koran, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, that's not a good reason. But on the other hand, um, the consideration that there's going to be a section of the population who are going to feel, you know, uh, really badly done by if the other religion is favored in a way that theirs is not or whatever, that's going to be a consideration of public, of public I mean, even Rawls would say that. I'm sorry for taking so long, but it's really so difficult. I mean, that issue about the referendum is really difficult. The torture is really difficult. The secession of so, There's no easy issue on a lot of these things. So that's a very good question. Uh, uh, you talk about, uh, um, you, you make an argument about the, the reasons. But I think another argument, the cognitive argument, I think about, you, for example, you in, in Just Freedom said, that you prefer avoid interfering like notch. I'm thinking about notch. Notch, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. So in, in your example, the way we choose between P or Q and Q and, and P is an example of uh, the, the, the fallacy of conjunction. Canon. So I, I'm thinking about. Uh, sorry, it's an example of. The, the conjunction fallacy. Oh yeah, right. From right, from right. Kahneman. Yeah. It, it's a it's a psychological approach. I was wondering the way you look at this approach, the notion approach, because I think in in some way they don't have any theoretical or political theoretical approach to explain that. But I think in some way, in somehow, your approach is is a good framework, theoretical framework to explain that. What do you think about that? For the nudging? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I, I, yeah, so for example, 
we know that, take something like, uh, actually Spain has a very good record, I remember, on this front. A major issue uh, in lots of countries, I was interested in about 15 years ago, because I was on the Australian Health Ethics Committee. So uh, a major issue was uh, how to retrieve organs from uh, people who are damaged in accidents and so on, right? Um, and now it turns out that if you separate, as Spain did, if I remember, if you separate the, uh, this is a great example of lodging, if you separate out the case where you, you separate out two doctors, one is the doctor looking after, say, your son who's been in, in a motorcycle accident, right? Really caring for him. And the other is a quite independent doctor who's going to be available to take the organ if the son is deemed, you know, irretrievably uh, damaged and brain dead or whatever. Uh, people are much happier, it turns out, to agree to the organ being given in the case where the, those offices are separated. <coughs> and in jurisdictions as they were in Spain, and I hope still are, in jurisdictions where it was the same doctor who both was looking after the son and was determining whether or not the organ should be harvested, you know, used to have somebody else, the people in question were very loath to, you know, go that way. Now, you know that by going the first way, the Spanish way, you're going to nudge people into giving more organs. Going the other way, you're going to nudge them in the other direction. Um, I would absolutely go for the first system, the Spanish system as well, because uh, it's really, really important that we have organs available. You know, in any country, the number of people living on dialysis, very, very inferior lives, you know, where they really could have been helped. It's, so it's an enormous benefit to society. So I would say that's a nudging case where, you know, and, and I have no worries about government adopting policies that will nudge people. They don't have, people still have the choice, you know? It's just, it's been set, it's been architectured, as, well, as they say, in such a way as to make one outcome more likely than the other. The better example is, is uh, you know, in your driving license, you ask, uh, are you willing to have your organs taken in the event of, you know? Uh, well, in a case like that, you can have an opt-in system or an opt-out system. Well, it turns out if you've got an opt-in system, whereby the assumption is you won't, but you can opt-in and say yes, only 10% opt-in. But if you've got an opt-out system, under which the assumption is you are willing to have your organs taken, 90% stay in, right? So you get totally different numbers. Now, I would say in that case, where there's no deception involved, it's not as if people are exposed to great danger if they agree to have their organs harvested. And it's really, really legitimate for government to put in the system that will nudge, in so to speak, the right as in, in the direction of the common interest. Even though it's, it's a framework from the government, not from the people. Yes, but it's answering to what is a presumptive interest on the part of ordinary people, I would say. I mean, in fact, that, that could come, I mean, after all, there's going to be a law to debate that. It's going to be debated in Parliament. There are going to be NGOs who keep an eye on what the law is. There are going to be discussions in the newspaper. All of that it means that if it goes through, it goes through with, uh, you know, almost certainly because it hasn't raised, you know, more than quite a small minority protests. So we're getting to the end, so there's two questions remaining, and I just want to ask you to keep them free. You mean me really keep the yeah. answers free? The questions are required. <laughs> but just I will a, try. Just yes. a very short question, although the, uh, the master is probably young, which is uh, the role of trust in your own country. I mean, uh, if people or the people are going to control over the government, that needs a big deal of trust, as uh, we probably know. Trust is very difficult to be obtained, very, very difficult to be kept, and it um, very seem to be unpleasant. So, how does it fit into your uh, into your into your whole theory? 
Well, I, yeah, I, I think that trust is absolutely central. Um, the, the issue where there's a problem is we want both to constrain certain authorities, but we also want to be able to trust them. And there are some constraint systems, penalty systems or reward systems, that actually ironically crowd out the possibility of trust. So for example, I'm, let's say, think of a particular concrete example now, I'm a hospital administrator, and you're a social worker in the hospital, right? It's really important to me that you do your job carefully, that you look after, you know, uh, the patients and so on, so on, that they really are helped in the various ways you need to help them, in cancer patients with their treatment, with the options available to them, advice and so on. And it's also important to me, of course, that I know that um, that you are reliably doing your job, you know? So on the one hand, I want to trust you, but on the other hand, oh, you know, can I trust you? I mean, should I? And now we know, for example, suppose I say, okay, I've got it. I'm going to introduce you to the law that says you've got a clock in every morning at 9 o'clock, or whatever it is, and you've got a clock out at 5.30. And I want to check on, the, on those times. Now, in the example I was aware of in my own life, um, it was a case where the social workers were working way overtime, you know? They were doing it on weekends, they were doing it in the evenings, you know, they were just an amazing group of people who were trusted by the administration. The administration proposed introducing this constraint, right? And you can be, they didn't happily, but you can be sure as sure of anything that if they introduced that constraint, they would lower the performance of, because they'd lose, those people lose the sense that they were trusted. They don't trust us, they want us to check in and check out. Okay, there are other constraint systems that don't have that antitrust, so to speak, like crowding out effect, crowding out motivation and trust. And I think in general, so for example, when you, when you turn up in parliament, uh, they insist on you putting your bag, you know, through a system for checking if you're bringing a bomb in or a gun or whatever. Uh, no one's going to feel they don't trust me, right? Because everybody goes through this. But if, for example, it was only, uh, let's say, people in uh, the Irish, only the Irish are only, only maybe a more visibly identifiable group, like uh, women wearing the hijab or whatever it might be, who are forced to do this. Now then, you, you really are going to discriminate against them, you know? So, but I think that the constraints that I'm talking about on government, which are constraints that everyone has to face, rule of law, you know, rule of reasons, uh, rule of checks, you know, consultation, uh, contestation, you know, elected to office, etc. These are all constraints that are not, so to speak, they don't induce defiance, they don't induce, you know, and consistently with imposing those, we can still trust these people. In fact, the nice thing here is I think some constraints crowd in trust rather than crowding it out. Because you realize that when you set up a law, you can signal to people what's expected of them. You know, like you set up a law that those in government really ought to give decent, you know, let's say, meet the press, you know, meet the media, sort of. Uh, and you know that uh, people in government can be motivated by that, you know, to think, yeah, that is really important, it's part of our, so you can actually have trust crowded in by a constraint. So I think trust is really crucial, but it's also crucial that the constraints we have crowded in rather than crowding it out, certainly that they can be crowded out. Thank you very much for your talk. My question is related to Alos and I guess at the end it has to, to do with the problem of um, a secession scenario. I don't want to bring this question to any particular case. Um, it is clear that you are very sensible and uh, has uh, said that it's a very difficult question. But my, 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 um, my question has to do with um, up to what point your model of uh, Republican government and the way in which this government uh, should and uh, can be controlled by 
my people. Um, um, in, the, in this model, um, um, the, the general framework in which a republican government uh, should work should be such that in one way or another should recognize uh, at least the possibility of not changing the framework, not controlling the framework, but the possibility of uh, a, 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 a relevant number of people uh, to be detached from that. So it's, it's, it's about the theoretical model. It's about the, the theoretical model. It's yeah. a, a Republican theoretical model that we write. Uh, yeah. um, um, should be such that some, in some way it should introduce uh, procedures or uh, dispositions or laws that at the end um, would allow people to to be detached from that framework at, at, the, at the theoretical level, yeah. not just any particular Well, I think, I mean, the crucial thing to say is that I should really mention this. Part of the framework in any country is that these are the boundaries, you know, that the territory is such and such, you know, that the jurisdiction extends over that territory. That's part of the framework, just as, you know, the rule of reason, the rule of law, etc., is part of the framework. Um, uh, or the rule of residency is part of the framework. So that's, that's given. And I think it's certainly part of the framework that should not be open to majority voting, either at the level of parliament, obviously, or at the level of a parliament, sub-parliament in that region, or at the level of the population in that region. Um, it would be sort of crazy to to allow a region to touch on the basis of a um, majority referendum. Of course, the reasons for that are, are obvious. You know, you have a country, you allow this. There are always going to be areas of country that are richer than others. And of course, they might be well tempted to detach. But then you get a mad sort of scramble of detachment and reattachment and so on. I mean, you would have. The one thing that's really, really important in in politics as distinct from war is that you've got settlement, you know, on a framework of some kind. And the boundaries part of the framework is one of the most important parts of that sort of settlement. And we know historically that once once boundaries become up for grabs, you know, this almost always leads to war, you know? It's the one sort of predictor of of war when boundaries are it's when boundaries are between states, for example, fixed, and no one's going to question them, and now it's from, so to speak, that base of unquestioned boundaries that you get connection. Then war is much easier to avoid. But if that very framework is itself contestable, you know, that makes for a, a real problem. That means that if you're going to allow secession, this is going to be part of the framework, is it better be under um, under you know conditions that are really quite stringent? Uh, as I said to Carlos, um, now exactly. Pardon. I mean, um, Pardon. That's sorry, Carlos. Yes. Carlos is a nice name. So, yeah, <laughs> of course we talked about it. Um, what exactly they should be is I don't think there's an abstract way you can. Um, I mean, as I said, this scholar I was thinking of in Germany, um, he he emphasizes that you know it, it should be a discontent that is you know really we can all understand it anywhere in the country, including the other parts of the country, that that is a very deep sort of discontent rather than you know we could be a bit richer if we moved away. You know, and that's not a deep discontent. You know. Um, and indeed, in any case, it's, it's really not a relevant reason by all lights. We could be richer, right? That's really favoring us, you know, but we'd be poorer on the other side. I mean, it's a zero sum type consideration. If, on the other hand, you know, a, an area can say, look, 
we're a different religion from you, we're a different whatever. We find, you know, the customs that you're imposing on us, you know, extremely contrary to our religion, very human genius. You know, that might be a consideration you might regard as, as very serious. Uh, but you also, there would have to be all sorts of other criteria, I would say, satisfied. The big issue, of course, is to whether or not even a supermajority and majority in the secessionary area should be allowed to determine secession. Uh, when there is, let's say, a powerful 10% of the population there who absolutely don't want it. I mean, they're vehemently opposed to it. And there's an issue about whether they can be territorially secluded and joined to the larger group or whatever. I mean, but these are, there, there are no principles to govern these sorts of things that are anything more than just sort of heuristics about the sorts of things you should be looking at. And I think, you know, with these, so to speak, non, how would you put them there? They're not, as it were, um, theoretically tractable in the sense that you don't have a theory that says, okay, it's a five year, right, okay, it's a certain tick, you know? You just can't have that. Those issues which are not theoretically sort of amenable in that sense, or tractable in that sense, they just require genius, you know? They require leadership, they require people willing to make compromises, willing to think about new things rather than just, you know, thumping the table, this is the way it is and we should never. And, you know, it's the sort of thing actually, so one thing, I mean, I blame Blair for the Iraq war and for taking part in it, but a great achievement of Blair was that he was the first English prime minister in 70 years or whatever it was, who was prepared to really look at solving the problem in Northern Ireland. It was never worth the while, electorally, of any other prime minister. And he and the Irish prime minister uh, and the different parties, they really worked out a very, very imaginative solution to what looked like a totally intractable problem. Um, but of course, Boris Johnson is quite happy to throw it away. I mean, <laughs> I mean talk about electing the best people to government. <laughs> I think Pablo had one final yeah. comment. A very, very quick follow up. What about changing the boundaries for the sake of including more territory and enhancing the citizenry? So, well, that's always going to be at the cost to another state, presumably. <laughs> well, if they consent. So, my, my question would be yeah. is some sort of cosmopolitan idea underlying or ingrained in your uh, republicanism? framework or not really? Well, I, I you know, good, that's, a, that's a very big question, a very good question, that, and maybe we can talk about that later. We will. I'm a, good, okay. <laughs> so I'm not a, um, I mean, there are sort of radical cosmopolitans who think that, you know, states, it's, get rid of them, they'll wither away, they're on the way out. You know. That was very popular in the, in the 1990s, you know, when it did look like it's a international organizations were taking over everywhere. And I didn't believe it then, I don't believe it now. I mean, I think that states were locked into worldwide, earthwide, a system of states in which no state's going to resign because, it's, you know, I mean, as in, okay, we're stopped over here, you know, because that creates territory and other states going to invade and any government, you know, that's got any identification with its, the people are not going to want to resign and just said well, the states are locked in. You know, states uh, you know, someone historian says somewhere, the state made war and war made the state, you know. Uh, I mean, we had advanced to a point or descended to a point where we are now locked into a worldwide system of states. And I don't see any likely way out of that system of states. They're not going to agree to a world state. Um, there's no international body, you know, that can sort of arbitrate peacefully so as to get states to dissolve. They're not going to resign. Um, and so I think we've got to live with the state. Now, I am a cosmopolitan, though, in the sense of thinking that states ought to be deeply committed, you know, to the welfare of the earth as a whole and to committing with other states, you know, decent states as it were to looking after the global commons and all of that and equally with other states to be prepared to act against oppressive states 
governments and equally to help impoverished states, you know, which are both two forms of dysfunctional states. I think that the international, the theory of international justice or international relations is, is even less theoretically tractable than domestic politics. You know, I think you can get so far with theory and domestic politics. I mean, that's why I find the Republican tradition quite exciting, because it's got a theory of democracy and a theory of, of domestic justice. It all points in the direction of, of international justice, of cosmopolitan justice. But it is, the agents are states, as I see it. There's no way, and I, I you know, I, I don't say it's improper to theorize about what it would be like to have a world without states. You know, like sometimes Jerry Cohen seemed to like that sort of theory. I don't say that. I just think, whatever about that, we certainly ought to be thinking about what ought to be done, assuming we have states, because it's very likely that assumption is going to continue to hold. And if we just do the other sort of theory, we'll have no, nothing to say about how states should be behave under, under that assumption. Very good. So on that, on that note, we just want to thank you again very much for coming. And, and A real pleasure. I, I,